because that means I am not necessarily part of the land anymore. It can, my land can be separated from my person. There is a continual erosion of tribal people's ability to maintain control over their own lives. And I think by the 1660s, Philip finds himself up against the wall. In other words, unless one makes a stand, the, the, the Wampanoag or the tribal people are going to be completely overrun. In 1671, rumors spread that Philip was growing angry and preparing to act. Authorities in Plymouth, Josiah Winslow chief among them, summoned Philip to account for himself. Josiah Winslow has no curiosity whatsoever about these people with whom he's grown up. He's known them all his life. He considers them an obstacle. He uh, considers them untrustworthy. He wants nothing more than to find a means of provoking a war that could lead to their extermination. You have, have you not, in recent times, procured a great and unusual supply of both ammunition and provisions, planning an attack on us both here in Taunton and in other places. These charges against me are false. If you have no such designs, have your men hand over their weapons. He had two choices, either give all the weapons up or acknowledge to the English that he was preparing for war, as they were accusing him of. So he had to choose the lesser of the two evils. Before taking his leave, Philip was made to sign a confession in which he admitted disloyalty to the English and promised to turn over any weapons the Wampanoag had amassed. This is a, a real turning point for Philip in that it's quite clear that the aims now of the English are not just to gain more and more land, not just to undercut Native people economically and spiritually, but uh, clearly to make uh, Native people their subjects. They no longer are being treated as equals. They're no longer being treated as allies. They're being treated essentially as second-class citizens in their own country. Philip was not eager to make a fight with the English. A war would shred his father's historic alliance and put his entire tribe in peril. There were only a thousand Wampanoag remaining, and nearly half were living in the praying towns. Philip had few warriors, but the Wampanoag chief did prepare, seeking allies among nearby tribes and quietly buying up firearms. At home in Mount Hope, with his English friends nearby, Philip wrestled with the enormity of a war against Josiah Winslow and Plymouth Colony. He was clearly a person caught in historical forces that gave him very difficult choices. And like many Indian leaders in those situations across the continent, he must have been weighing the options of peace and war. He must have been trying to balance conflicting pressures. Betrayal forced Philip's hand. In January 1675, Philip's personal secretary traveled to Plymouth to warn Governor Winslow that Philip was arming for war. Three weeks later, the secretary was dead. English authorities arrested three of Philip's men, tried them for the murder, and executed them. For Indian people, of course, a killing of an Indian by an Indian in Indian country was something that should have been settled by Indian people. After that blatant assault on Indian sovereignty, Philip must have been under incredible pressure from his warriors to step up and do something about this. As whispers of a coming war spread among the English colonists that following summer, the deputy governor of Rhode Island invited Philip to a meeting to offer some friendly advice. Unipi, I'm Philip. Mm. 
We thank you for coming over to speak with us. Our business is to try to prevent you from doing wrong. Mata na pani asaman. No macha man na koma man. Onisa na ucho kosa walk. Ma onisa na kut nino one. We have done no wrong. We sena kut nino one. If you start a war against the English, much blood will be spilt. A war will bring in all Englishmen, for we're all under own king. I urge you to lay down your arms, Philip. Because the English are too strong for you. Then the English should treat us as we treated the English when we were too strong for the English. Philip's angry young warriors refused to heed Easton's warning that war with Plymouth would bring every colony in New England down on their heads. Days after the conference with Easton, Philip sent warning from Mount Hope to an old English friend in nearby Swansea. It might be best to leave the area. Wampanoag warriors began their rampage. Philip stood with them, convincing other aggrieved tribes in the area, including the Wampanoag's old rival, the Narragansett, to join their fight against New England, a fight the English would come to call King Philip's War. This war that breaks out in New England is a major war. It has a big impact on the societies in New England, both Native American and white. By the winter of 1676 or so, to get outside of Boston uh, for Europeans was a very dangerous pr uh, prospect. Native American forces had devastating victories over the English in the early months of that war, destroyed large numbers of towns and people and property, and were very much uh, winning that war, putting the English on, on a defensive. The war spread to Connecticut. The war spread into Rhode Island. The war spread into eastern New York. Tribe after tribe after tribe became involved in this. English colonists from the outlying villages fled to bigger towns. Some simply boarded ships and headed back to Europe. Alarmists among the English feared they would all be driven into the sea. The English look now very differently at Indian people. Even those Indian people who have lived among them, even those Indian people who have committed to living a Christian life and are living in the praying towns. These Indians now come to be regarded as, at the very least, a potential fifth column, as people who cannot be trusted, as people who are liable to turn on you at any time. As winter approached, the colonists banished hundreds of Christian Indians living in the praying towns, men, women, and children. They took them on a forced march to uh, the Charles River, put them in canoes, and uh, put them on Deer Island, in the middle of Boston Harbor, which at that time of year is a cold, blustery place. Over three or four hundred perished from lack of uh, food and exposure because they gave them uh, no blankets or food or anything and just dumped them there. The war ground on month after month, exacting a terrible price. 25 English towns were destroyed. More than 2,000 English colonists died. But the shared danger did unite the colonies, and they lashed back. In early 1676, Philip could feel the tide turning. And then the powerful Mohawks, longtime allies of the English, made a surprise attack, killing almost 500 of Philip's men and dooming his confederacy. A year into the war, scores of Indian villages had been burned to ash. 5,000 native people had died. Hundreds of men, women, and children who did survive, heathen malefactors, Josiah Winslow called them, were loaded onto boats, shipped to the West Indies in Europe, and sold into slavery. Native tribes in southern New England had been crushed. 
and would never again control their destiny in their homeland. In the summer of 1676, Philip retreated home to Mount Hope with his wife and children. His cause, all but lost. It does seem a little unusual that he would come back to Mount Hope because there are so many troops around there looking for him. It's like consciously walking into a trap. When he returns to Mount Hope, he certainly has given up. He's going there to die. Rather than a grand, heroic military figure, he's a more poignant, sad figure, a person filled with sorrow at the end of his life. On August 12, 1676, an English militia unit, along with a praying Indian named John Alderman, surprised Philip and his dwindling band of followers. After Philip was shot by Alderman, they dismembered his body. The discarded right hand of Philip was given to Alderman as a, a trophy of the war. His parts were strewn about the colonies, spread to the four corners. This is a warning to other people, to other Indian people. This is what the English will, this is how the English will deal with rebellion deal with treason and remember that in English eyes Philip was a traitor and this was the punishment meted out by 17th century Englishmen to traitors. Massasoit's son was dead and scattered but the colonists were taking no chances. They captured Philip's son and heir, a nine-year-old boy, and locked him in a jail in Plymouth. While English authorities deliberated on whether to sell the boy into slavery or simply murder him, the Puritans gave thanks to their God. And the final day of Thanksgiving of the war is the day that Philip's head is marched into Plymouth. This decapitated head on a pole, it's erected in the center of, in the center of town and is cause for a great celebration. They wouldn't take it down, Philip's head. For two decades, while Philip's son lived in slavery in the West Indies, the head was displayed in Plymouth a reminder to the Indians about who was in charge, a reminder to the English that God continued to smile on their endeavor. It's hard to see how conflict could have been avoided and how the outcome of that war could have been different. Looking at the generation before this war, there is at least a moment where things were different. 